Welcome to the review and thoughts of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, the movie from 69. Nice. Not that it matters, but most of the following is true. So, I really love this film. Uh, there will be some jokes in this video. I'm not going to get into very many serious topics. A little bit, you know I me, mean, but not a huge amount. This is the most charming film that I've watched in a long time. If it were a man, I'd want to be friends with him. If it were a woman, I'd want to date her. If they were non-binary, it would depend on how attracted we were to each other. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. And, yeah, so, the review itself will not have any spoilers. I will only get into spoilers once I get into the thoughts sections. If I decide to spoil this movie or anything else, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler. So, if you don't want to hear the spoiler, you can just mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Let's yeah, so the movie is rated PG, and so is this video. And so, yeah, I have watched every single Western I've been able to. I am a really big fan of Sergio Leone and Clint Eastwood. And uh, yeah, that's. Uh, let's see. So yeah, this I only watched this movie once, and I literally just got done watching it. Like that was ten minutes ago, I think. And right, since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it is possible I will touch my face. I'm gonna show you. I washed my hands since the last time I was outside. I will wash my hands again before going out. And yeah, so the plot. I am going to use some of the IMDb uh, plot synopsis. So, Wyoming, early 1900s. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid are the leaders of a band of outlaws. And I think I am going to... I'm going to keep it vague after that. Let's just say that something goes... Things don't go exactly as they had hoped. Now, like with a lot of Westerns, we are expected to empathize not with the law enforcement, but with the criminals. This movie does at least have one of the train robbers say the money they're stealing was inherited, not earned. And yes, I realize that, you know, even before these... Um, even before they started making westerns you know there was already uh, you know some romanticization of the outlaw and let's see that brings us to the writing so this was written by William Goldman RIP and yeah he had 32 movie writing credits between 1963 and oh wow some of it is very yeah yeah some of this is inspired by but uh, yeah um there's something called the monkey wrench gang which he apparently wrote the screenplay for that's not come out yet so but yeah you know that does sometimes happen I gotta say other than this movie I know three of his movies through through the movies that he wrote fierce creatures although he's uncredited the ghost in the darkness which he's credited as written by and the chamber which he's credited with the screen oh right and maverick yeah I don't know how I missed that one but yeah the these are the only of his movies that I'm familiar with. I honestly, I might try to find some of the, yeah, this, this was very, very, yeah. And, and his screenplay is a big part of why I love this movie. And let's see, so. Um, 
yeah, so the the Let's see. Yeah, so the the right, there were some things that uh, Goldman yeah, there's a there's a direct quote from Goldman here. My movie script was darker than the film because of these elements, and ultimately the elements are things that are spoilers for the film. So I'm not going to get it. You know, it, it's it's I'm to be trivia. So you know, you can find it if you don't want to scroll through. Just do a word search for my movie script was darker. You know, so but but yeah. So in that regard, and and. I can definitely see what he means because this this is not the darkest that I've I've seen. And let's see. Yeah, so Roger Ebert, R.I.P. He, you know, a lot of a lot of his movie critique was very apt, but this is one of the cases where I feel like he just didn't completely understand what it was going for. There's a quote here from him that says, William Goldman's script is constantly too cute and never gets up the nerve by God to admit it's a Western. And I, I think he misinterpreted. It's not a movie that's ashamed of being a Western. It's a different kind of Western. You know, the... And and I, for, I, I thought that was very... Like, I've seen a lot of Westerns, and this is... And a lot of them I chose to watch as well as see, and yeah, this this is very different from a lot of them. And I th yeah, I think there's a reason for that, and I'm gonna get into it in the in the thoughts sections when I talk spoilers. And let's see, right, a screenplay steeped in both nos nostalgia and a timely sense of insight. And let's. See. The story is mostly composed of short pieces telling a little story about Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. There is really no connection all the way through for the most part. That's, yeah. And I, I think that works for it. I, I agree that for a lot of movies that would be a bad thing. I forget if that critic thought that it was a bad thing, but yeah. And I forget if I noted, but yeah, these are these are critic quotes. I will note when I get back to... Uh, the story isn't about the plot, however. It is about Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. It's a close look at two criminals, the talented Sundance Kid and Butch Cassidy, the one who does all the thinking. The charisma and screen presence of the two actors and the way they work together is what drives the film. Watching the two interact with a superb script full of great dialogue is what makes the movie so exciting. The writing was great and creative. I've never witnessed a movie that was so serious and yet so funny. The writing totally propelled this movie forward. And this has got to be some of the best writing ever. And yeah, I'm not sure I have much to add to that. I... Yeah, honestly, yeah, I feel the, the you know... Sometimes I don't always, I, I don't always have a lot to add to, to critic quotes. Now, the movie does a good job handling the plot twists. There's not many, none of them are bad. I wouldn't say that it, there are too few, it's not really a movie driven by plot twists. I suppose some might characterize some of the plot twists as being too easy to figure out for the viewer. I would rather, I, the way I see it is that the plot, the plot is not necessarily the most unpredictable, but it is a story about kind of consequences, you know, the, the, over the course of it, various people will discuss what they think the future is and ultimately the yeah the movie yeah by I would say by the end of the movie the movie has basically stated 
you know, here's here's who was right about what the future holds. Here is what, yeah, for for the for the time, not not the future of 1969, but the future of what was it? The early I'm gonna find it real quick. The early 1900s. And that brings us to the direction by George Roy Hill, R.I.P. And this is the this is the only movie of his his that I've watched. But I do think he did a really great job directing here. And uh, right, in addition to yeah, he he directed 14 movies between 62 and 88. He has six TV directing credits. Let's see. Yeah. So let's see the. So according to IMDb trivia, director John Borman was a stern critic of this particular popular movie, claiming that its success had begun the decline of the western genre. And let's. Um, right, and Conrad L. Hall said it was, uh, cinematographer Conrad L. Hall said it was George Roy Hill's decision not to show, I'm going to keep it vague here, there, there's a significant element of the film that are not shown, yeah, not shown very clearly. Radios were used to coordinate so that they could be very far away with the cameras and yeah and and there was actually some fortuitous timing in some of those scenes and let's see right and yeah um i think i will I want to get into this, but I want to get into it when I'm in the spoiler section, so I am gonna put it here so I don't forget. There we go. And in the first previews, the audiences went wild with loud extended laughter, which upset director George Roy Hill, who thought perhaps he had made the film too funny. They laughed at my tragedy, he said, and reworked it to take out some of the bigger laughs. I gotta say, yeah, I, I found this very, very funny, so I don't, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I haven't seen the stuff he took out, so yeah, that might have been some of the biggest laughs, but... Yeah, I, I don't know how he... I, I agree that there are tragic elements. But, yeah, this is this is a very funny movie. And, let's see... Right, so, the... Yes, some critic quotes. The John Foreman production is episodic, but George Roy Hill's direction is so satisfying in catching the full value of the Goldman screenplay that a high degree of interest is sustained. I, I would definitely say this. I was never bored watching this, which obviously you risk you risk losing the audience if you make a movie that is episodic. You know, if you're making a, a miniseries or TV show or something, you can make it episodic. It it works really well to make it episodic. Not not always, but some yeah. But a movie you got to be careful. And I thought it really worked. I was never pulled out of the movie. I, you know. I'm not saying you're wrong if that did happen for you, but, you know, I I would definitely say that the movie keeps, there's, there's always something very interesting that, yeah. And, let's see. Yeah, some some one one critic said the initially tense sequence becomes slow and boring as it drags on, and the movie never recovers. I def I would definitely say the movie the movie changes, but I liked what it changed into. 
Before Butch Cassidy, Westerns had an avowed aversion to having any fun unless the film in question was explicitly a comedy. One-off jokes were reserved for building up the likability of relatively generic protagonists for the most part. The dynamic between Newman and Redford would change that completely as they demonstrated that Westerns could stand to have actual charisma rather than machismo exclusively. The film delivers a distinct blend of comedy and charm mixed with sincere commentaries on the declining West and finding yourself outdated, but not yet dead. And... Let's... Hill directed Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid with an eye for unique shots. Every one of his films... Ah, yeah. There are many gripping scenes, gripping to the last moment. His use of camera tricks, directorial angles, and sudden jump cuts is incredibly creative. George Roy Hill is particularly brilliant for starting the film with a sepia-toned suspense sequence. And let's see. Hill's choice immediately sucks you into the West world of westerns. Let's see. Yeah. Um... Yeah, some, some people felt, okay, so the, let's see, the director George Roy Hill doesn't have the style for it, the tone becomes embarrassing, George Roy Hill is a sincere director, but Goldman's script is jocose, though it reads as if it might play, it doesn't, and probably this isn't just Hill's fault, see, I disagree with that, but that is definitely how some people have felt, and some future reviews might feel. Yeah, some people really didn't like And see. every character, every scene is marred by the film's double view, which oscillates between sympathy and farce. Again, I personally found they found a great balance. That's also, I, some of these reviews are from back then, and at the time, it wasn't really mainstream to do. You know, today, you have movies that go back and forth between being very serious and being more comedic. You know, the MCU has basically made that, uh, you know, it's, that's that's a big part of, you know, most MCU movies and, and projects, and I say that as someone who loves them. But but yeah, at the time, this was seen as you can't you can't do both. For for sure, some of the jokes in this are closer to like you know a parody movie. Like yeah, if if uh, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Um, it's I'm I'm gonna have it yeah if Mel Brooks were to direct a parody of this movie like a lot of the or, or actually yeah let me rephrase that if Mel Brooks had directed a parody of this story before they had made a movie a lot of the jokes in this movie might have been in his movie you know and and yeah for sure that was not something that everyone was was okay with and I can imagine that back then you know that that is sometimes maybe in some ways it was ahead of its time uh, you know because yeah today like ah uh, what was I forget who there was someone who made this point recently that comedy ah uh, okay it was it was either the take or uh, I'm gonna try to print yeah. Cheyenne Lin. It was either a recent video by the take or it was the Cheyenne Lin video what happened to the gross out rom-com but somebody here on YouTube recently pointed out that it used to be seen as there's comedy and then there's everything else you know you can't have comedy if you're trying to also scare people or have you know have yeah have a tragedy or or these various kinds of you know you you're either making a serious movie or you're making a comedy and 
yeah, today there are a lot of things that have, you know, I, I mean, are there still a lot of po-faced, always serious things? Isn't there comedy in almost everything? I, I gotta admit, there, there's a lot of movies and shows I don't watch, but I feel like I've heard that pretty much everything by now, there's, there's not very much that doesn't have some comedy, some jokes, some lightness, and... Yeah, this was probably one of the first times that was really done. Let's see. I, I suppose I should just briefly say, when, when I brought up Mill Brooks, I'm thinking maybe specifically of something like the his, his Robin Hood movie, um, Men in Tights, which is sort of, you know, it takes some elements from Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, the, the Kevin Costner movie, and the uh, the adventures of Robin Hood from 1938, I want to say, where Robin Hood was played by Errol Flynn, and you know the the jokes in the Mel Brooks movie are you know lighter and more comedic than you know like like in those in the two serious Robin Hood movies, although I don't know that many people would call the 1938 one particularly serious necessarily. It's a lot like the, the books and such. I, I really, I hope one day we get another Robin Hood movie that's like when you just sit down and read one of the books about Robin Hood, because he was fun, you know? And so many, you know, so many filmmakers seem to think, no, 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 we have to make him super serious. If he's not serious, people aren't going to take him seriously. And it's just like, some things don't need to be taken seriously. Anyway, yeah, the, the jokes in the Mel Brooks movie are, you know, the, yeah, when, when you're laughing in the, the ah, let's see, the, the Kevin Costner one, you're laughing because a character intentionally made a joke and we're maybe we're laughing at one of the villains being ridiculous, or we're like laughing with Robin. There, there are a couple of times where we also laugh at Robin, but you know, a lot of the times he did or said something funny. And you know, Mel Brooks makes it even more comedic, even more you know out there. And that's also what this movie does. You know, a, a lot of the jokes in this movie, like if I. If I had watched this completely without context, I didn't know when it was from, I didn't know if it was supposed to be a serious movie at times, I might have thought that this was a parody of a different, you know, and, and yeah, there are, there are funny westerns, you know, there was that one, um, I, I admit I haven't watched a huge amount, but I, let's see, the, um, I watched, you know, Lee Van Cleef, uh, that's probably, I pronounced that, R.I.P. Um, but yeah, he was in some of the, let's see, if I can recognize by title, I, let's see. Hmm. Maybe not, but but yeah, there's he was in Oh wait, no, this is this is the one. Yeah, so it's called El Karate, El Cult y El Impostor. Yeah, I know. You don't have to tell me. Um I'm not great at I wanna say that's Italian. Um okay, so in English it's sometimes known sometimes known as Blood Money uh, the Stranger and the Gunfighter in Canada. Um, yeah, I think that's gonna have to do, but yeah, um, a martial artist joins a hard-hitting gunfighter in the search for treasure while bandits step into their way. And yeah, it is, that is very much a comedy, you know, so it's not that they never did those, but it is, it tended to be more, like, separated. If, if I recall, this is the movie 
where like it's this thing of I guess I'll keep it vague and just say there is there is some information on a particular part of the human body that is not normally available to strangers and the movie has you know yeah they have to convince these women to to actually reveal that particular part of the body so you know we are the movie isn't trying to be serious at all and let's see I think that right one yeah one one I think there's a user review best watched after Sergio Leone's masterpieces have faded from memory I didn't take that advice and found myself thinking this is so weak and that's the thing you really got and you got to be in the right frame of mind for for this I was not trying to compare it to you know I mean uh, I would. Yes, ultimately, I would rate, uh, you know, almost everything I've seen by Sergio Leone higher than this, but that doesn't mean that this is bad. It's just, I, I don't think it's fair to compare very much, very many movies to, to Sergio Leone movies. That's just, you know. And, yeah, some, some, um... Some user reviews expressed that they watched it when it first came out, and re-watching it today... Uh, yeah, I'll just quote. For the life of me, I cannot understand why I ever liked this movie or how it got the reputation it has. Is it simply a bad movie that does not hold up well? Oh, right. He makes the claim that it is simply... Yeah, that I completely disagree with. It is a good movie. The way it has aged does... Yeah. And you know, I don't know. Maybe if I if I watched it again, you know, I can imagine it is maybe a movie that plays, you know, it plays ex exceptionally well on a first viewing if you're in the right frame of mind. I don't know. I guess I can't rule out. Nah, honestly, I I don't think I don't. I think I would love this movie, you know, no matter how many times I watch it. But yeah. And let's see. Yeah, yeah. He says there's one significant sequence that he felt the length of the scene could have been cut by about two thirds. And yeah, multiple parts that he felt were too long. And he had fast forward, and even at double speed, was surprised how long it took to get to end of the sequence. And again, just yeah, I'm not going to claim that those sequences are short or that they're you know or that they stop once the point has been made but I really felt that it worked and let's see hmm. yeah and and here's a person that says you know the movie just didn't hold my interest though both unsolved mysteries and in search of the excellent jobs focusing on butch and I'd much, I yeah, I'd much rather watch those accounts than this film. And yeah, I understand why some people hate the movie. I've already mentioned that I loved it. I think that an important part is your expectations need to match the final product. Now that might sound obvious, but what I'm saying is, the movie is actually well made. I'm not being an apologist for a bad movie. I I try to, you know, I there are bad movies that I, you know, feel some that I take some enjoyment from, I try to be very clear and say, okay, this is not a good movie, but under the right circumstances it can be enjoyable. You know, I, I don't think there's something wrong with enjoying a bad movie. And I, I definitely don't think there's anything wrong with acknowledging that there is such a thing as a bad movie. Not not every movie is 
good. You you know some some of them are are very different from others, but it really you you can't just I I don't think it makes sense to say that it's completely subjective that there is no such thing as a bad movie. Now the the ah uh, let's see I I do try to be very open to unusual movies. And, you know, movies that I, yeah, that are different from what I'm used to, I suppose I should say. But, yeah, um, I, th I think it's important with media to be critical so that we don't keep getting something that is just okay. Because there are some people who make mass media who will just keep making stuff that's not particularly good if they're not, you know quote-unquote, yeah, I'm not going to use the word forced, but pushed into, you know, for, for a while, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name, too, uh, Uwe Boll, or actually, I, I hear that, you know, that's that's how we pronounce it, because we look at a U, a double we, W, and an E, and say, oh, like that, you know, but in German, it is apparently pronounced U, so... It is very disrespectful to the man to pronounce it Uwe Boll. So Uwe Boll, for a very long time, made bad movies. Like, he, he wasn't trying to make good movies because of this, ah, uh, let's see, there's like a loophole in German tax law where if the movie doesn't make a lot of money, you know, he was he was, he was the producer for, for a chunk of his career. And... I've heard that he eventually started trying, and now his movies are just kind of boring. They used to be fun bad, now they're just boring bad. Until he was basically forced to... Holy crap, how many In the Name of the King movies? Will somebody please stop him from making In the Name of the King movies? So he's made three. And from what I hear, they're all terrible. I've, I've only watched one of his movies myself, The House of the Dead, the, the original 2003 movie, and that movie is so bad, I don't... I probably will never watch one of his movies, unless someone is like, no, 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 you're gonna, you're gonna laugh your ass off at this one, you know, but that... I, I didn't find that one funny bad, I just, I just thought it was exhausting, tedious. But anyway, yeah, the... the um, until he had to, he kept making bad movies, and I realized that was that was a legal thing, not that people were, you know, just. I, I'm not sure anybody particularly thinks that Uwe Boll is a good director, but yeah, you know, so I think that it is important to be critical of the media we consume. Now, the opening of this film is, you know, we get this possibly in-universe recap of what the gang have been up to, you know, up, have, have done up to this point via a short black and white silent film with romantic music playing over at least some of it, and the opening credits run, uh, uh, let's see, I want to say the opening credits ran like next to, I'm, I'm gonna look really, really quickly, and be able to confirm there we go so the yeah yeah the the opening credits yeah basically on the left side of the screen you have the picture and on the right you know but yeah they take up a half each the the right half has the opening credits because you know you might not yeah this was back when the credits ran at the start of films, and for a lot of old films, you just kind of have to sit through, you know, just... But here they give us visuals for it. And the black and white fades into color, not immediately, but, you know, <laughs> if you start watching it, you know, don't, don't worry. It is not a black and white movie from start to finish, you know. It's, yeah, it's, it has the, the black and white opening, and then the, or, or sepia tone, really. And, and the, uh, there are, there are more sequences in the film that are also sepia tone, but other than that, it is, it is color. 
and just yeah um, basically it tells you what people knew and kind of the 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 perception I guess of of the of the duo and their gang and yeah just it's it's a really great way to open it like I could easily see you know it's 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 not essential you could start the movie just you know yeah text on white text on black screen which is what the the credits themselves and that's also I really appreciate I don't know who made the decision but someone's you know said no 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 a half of the move half of the sh screen will be the silent film half of the screen will be the credits never the twain shall meet and that was definitely the right decision because that it's, yeah but but yeah uh, I really appreciate when when movies back when they had to I, I I think it was was there like a legal thing that they had to have the the creds I I think people weren't expected to stay at the end maybe or something you know, but today movies you know and and it's probably good because you know like big blockbuster movies today have like 10 minutes of end credits no way would people sit through that at the start of the movie now i am not going to give away whether the you know whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending but it fits with what came before i think the ending is great i th i think it's exactly as it should be no Deus Ex Machina, no other convenient writing, and that brings us to the character. So, yes, Paul Newman, R.I.P., played Butch Cassidy, and let's see, yeah, According to IMDb Trivia, Paul Newman, who was reluctant to do a comic role, thought he was scaling his performance a little too high, a little too broad. But director George Roy Hill got him to do less and find his own level of wry humor that fit the character. Paul Newman had to fight to get Robert Redford cast, Redford being still a relative unknown at the time. Paul Newman didn't want to play Butch, pleading with George Roy Hill to watch what Newman considered one of his worst performances in the comedy Rally Round the Flag Boys from 1958. I'm a terrible com comic actor, Newman insisted, but became more convinced when Hill told him he didn't have to go for the jokes, but to just play it straight. And, yeah, I, th I think he did a great job. Uh, the, the charisma is just, like, just, just, yeah. Um, he seems like this, this is a character that you really would want to be around, you know, unless you're, you know, working for a, a bank or something, but otherwise just, he seems like such, yeah, just a, a beacon of, of charm. And Robert Redford portrays the Sundance Kid and, let's see. Right. Um, according to Wikipedia, the role of Sundance was offered to Jack Lemmon, but he turned down the role. He did not like riding horses, felt he had already played too many aspects of the Sundance Kid's character before. Other actors considered for the role were Steve McQueen, Warren Beatty, who both turned it down. Beatty claiming the film was too similar to Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah, there's definitely an argument to be made there, yeah. According to Goldman, McQueen and Newman both read the scripts at the same time and agreed to do the film. McQueen eventually backed out of the film due to disagreements with Newman. Two actors would eventually team up in the 1974 disaster film The Towering Inferno, which I'm pretty sure... I'm going to real quick check... Oh, never mind. I apparently haven't watched that one. It sounded really familiar, though, but yeah. Um, I really, really like Stephen Queen, R.I.P. Um, I don't think he would have been as good of a, of a Sundance kid as Robert Redford is. 
but you know, yeah, uh, I think he's incredible in Bullet, for example, and what's he called the uh, the Hunter or something like that, where he's like I, I f think that was maybe in the waning days of his career, and he understood like he's not he's not trying to still look, you know, this is not a, a Shatner toupee situation. He accepts I'm aging. This is what aging looks like, and just yeah. And according to IMDb Trivia, Robert Redford did not agree with Paul Newman on the need for a rehearsal, feeling that it lessens the spontaneity, but he conceded out of respect for his co-star. And I gotta say, I, I think it did still really work. It did still feel spontaneous, but yeah. So, so that's, uh, you know, yeah, I, I think Redford made the right choice. Yeah, I know, I know. Trekkies are gonna be pissed about the the toupee comment. I'm just saying Picard accepted that he was balding. Now right, Catherine Ross plays Etta Place. And yeah, I'm just going to let's see. Um, yeah, so uh, various user reviews criticized her performance. Uh, I, yeah, okay, I guess I'll just very briefly... Um, Catherine Ross was given little... was not given much to do in the film, but what she did get, she did poorly reciting her lines, mostly in a dull monotone. And he says that she was better in the Stepford Wives. And yeah, I, I'm i going to be talking about something else about her. Yeah, so, IMDb Trivia. On the first day of shooting involving the train robbery scenes, Catherine Ross came to the set to watch. There were five cameras and only four operators, so cinematographer Conrad L. Hall put her on the extra camera. He showed her how to operate it, how to move it to get her shot, Director George Roy Hill was furious, but said nothing the whole day. At the end of the day, however, he banned her from the set, except when she was working. Catherine Ross enjoyed shooting a very particular sequence best because it was handled by the film's crew's second unit rather than the director. She said, any day away from George Roy Hill was a good one. This was after she had been scolded and banned from the set by Hill for operating a camera, even though cinematographer Conrad Hall who Ross was dating, invited her to do it. Hall wasn't punished by Hill for letting her. So yeah, the actress took an interest in the filmmaking process beyond her acting, which pissed off the director, and as far as I've read, it, you know, because of his anger, it hurt her career. And I personally think the fact that the director was so angry with her negatively affected her performance. Like, if, you know, he he banned her from the set, you know, imagine going to work every day with someone who literally doesn't want you to be there other than when you have to work together. I'm guessing, you know, because of contract and such, she, you know, they couldn't have recast her by that point. So she just, you know, went to work every single day knowing that the director hated her and wished she wasn't there. So, yeah, it's... I agree that her performance isn't amazing, which, you know, I, I think she's quite good in The Graduate, for example, but, yeah, um, I really think that's, you know, what it is. Thankfully, the you know this kind of thing is gradually becoming a thing of the past. Margot Robbie today is a successful producer in addition to actress, influencing the films with more than her performance. And I sincerely believe that that kind of thing is going to become a lot more commonplace, despite there still being a lot of sexism and misogyny in media and in general. But yeah, this I I, I prefer when people correctly diagnose uh, a problem. I don't, I really don't think it was her, you know, not having the talent. It, it really strikes me as being, you know, the, the, yeah, the director not liking her. And once again, first day of shooting. So it was 
all the way through shooting that he didn't like her and didn't want her to be there if it wasn't strictly necessary for her to be there. So, yeah. I, I don't think that she, what's the sports term, through the game. I think that she did the best she could, but it was very uncomfortable for her to be, you know, yeah. And, yeah, um, this is one of those movies that, you know, because of how old it is, a lot of the, the, the cast are, are dead. Um, I want to, you know, underline, this was apparently, like, Sam Elliott does appear in this, although, uh, let's see, is it something about you don't actually, you don't see his face, you maybe hear his voice or something like that, but yeah. Uh, and, you know, I... I'm pretty sure he's still alive. Um gonna check to make absolutely sure. Still alive. Oh right, yeah, he was in Star is Born. The the new one. Um and Cloris Leachman, R.I.P. played Agnes. And yeah, you know, I've I don't think I've ever disliked a Cloris Leachman performance, so but yeah. Um I think basically all of them did a, a good job on this. I don't think any performance was really off, and some of them have to, you know, there are some very, ah, what's the word? Mm. Some aspects of their characters are very difficult to... Now, yeah, um, right, so some critic quotes Paul Newman and Robert Redford's charisma and camaraderie creates interest throughout. Notably, the supporting cast in Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid is impeccable. And... Jeff Corey gets a... Oh, yeah, this person actually did like it. Catherine Ross is dreamy as the... Yeah, the girlfriend. Jeff Corey gets a shining moment when he scolds Butch and Sundance as Sheriff Bledsoe. Even a young Cloris Leachman makes an appearance as the sultry Agnes. That's right, that's... Yeah, I... Yeah, it makes out with... Yeah, and let's see. Yeah, there are a lot of quotes when when you read critic reviews about how amazing the the two stars are, how charismatic they are. Let's see. Yeah, um, Newman, Redford, and Miss Ross must be broadly funny and straight almost simultaneously. Yeah, it's... Yeah. And... Let's see. Um, hmm. Yeah, I suppose that is... Right, yeah, one critic says, it holds up well for a movie so redolent of its particular time, the 1960s, of course, not the 1890s. And... Yeah. Second, whether the filmmakers fully intended it this way or not, it's really a very good film about a topic westerns don't tackle often. Arrested Adolescence. Most great westerns, My Darling Clementine, Rio Bravo, The Wild Butch, Unforgiven, are about adults. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid is about two guys who physically are pushing 40, but whose mental age is stuck somewhere around 16. They may be charming, but their whole lives revolve around their narcissistic palship. For them, being outlaws doesn't seem to be about expressing antisocial impulses or even getting money they haven't earned, but merely about hanging out with each other. Their talk with each other is mainly brittle, ritualized patter and stock jokes mixed with Butch's pipe dreams. Screenwriter William Goldman emphasizes the oddly callow adolescent tone of their 
relationship by repeatedly having them express surprise when they stumble over some bit of biography, their real names, that you'd think real friends would have known about decades ago. Yeah. And so the, yeah, the dialogue, you know, there's near constant wit and snarcasm, and it is impeccably written and delivered. And some of the time characters in this movie talk the way people do in real life. There is no white noise dialogue, and it does a good job conveying characterization and exposition. And yeah, there's a lot of bickering and arguing. You know, some people love it, some people hate it. I get why some people hate it. I, you know, I read in reviews, oh, they're arguing a lot. And I kind of, I figured that I was going to end up hating, but I found myself really loving it. I usually hate when people are just arguing a lot. I forget, uh, I'm, let's see, I believe it was Linkara, he was, when he was talking about the, it was maybe a comic book adaptation of the Hobbit book. I, f I feel like that was where he pointed out that you know, it does it. It doesn't keep being interesting. It just gets kind of annoying after a while. But I, I don't know if kids ever did really like it. But there at least used to be an idea that oh, that's something kids really like. So kids' books have to have a lot of arguing. I remember even as a kid, I was like, can we just get on with it? This is unbelievably obnoxious. But you know, my parents were good enough to buy books that didn't have a lot of it. But yeah, occasionally I would find a book like that. Yeah. Anyway, I love basically every line in this. I was laughing throughout most of it, I would say. Let's see. And and yeah, maybe that that is in part this, you know, I'm used to something going back and forth between being very serious and being very comedic. In, you know, yeah, a lot that I watch. Now that brings us to the cinematography. So, Conrad L. Hall, R.I.P., was the cinematographer on this movie. He had 32 credits total, starting in 58 and ending in 2002, all as theatrical movies. And other than this, the ones I know are Road to Perdition, American Beauty, A Civil Action... Uh, yeah, those are those. The, yeah, yeah, he is very. Ta he was very talented, and it really shows. You know, I'm, I'm. There are some issues with American Beauty that I'm not going to be defending. I'm not going to. You know, when 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 it was made, it was. Yeah, honestly, it might still get made today. But there are some things in that movie that are thankfully more called out today than when the movie was made but it's definitely well shot and let's see and Yeah, so according to IMDb Trivia, the cinematographer said he overexposed much of the film. He thought the lightness of the story did not require dramatic lighting and color. But 20th Century Fox and Deluxe, the color film processing lamp, brought back a lot of the richness of tones, as was their trademark style. Yeah, I, I could definitely see how, yeah, the movie would be very different if without the, the dramatic lighting and color, but... Yeah, I, I, having watched some movies where the film was overexposed, I am not a fan of that kind of thing. I, th I think dramatic lighting and color can work in comedies, and did here. And and certainly, like, yeah, it it says he overexposed much of the film, so he might have. He might not have overexposed the scenes that were meant to be dramatic, but, yeah. It's wild to think, because, you know, today, that it would just be, no, 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 you know, we 
we, we we shot on digital we can just do it the other way and it might get you know released looking overexposed which I'm trying to avoid being too critical I don't want to speak ill of the dead and and certainly you know I think he did amazing work on this uh, so yeah uh, let's see yeah so critic quote I really like Hill's perspective and yeah the Okay, yeah, the, the, yeah. I really like Hill's perspective behind the fence while Butch rides a bicycle so that the motion of his riding looks like a film reel. The sepia-toned montage of pictures... Uh, Hill just... Un yeah, very fun too. Hill just understands how to direct beautiful scenes and thrilling chase sequences. Conrad Hall's cinematography is a stunning use of far wide shots for epic scale natural scenery. The dry desert and green valleys look phenomenal in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. The extended chase sequence in. Uh, just, uh, is, is gripping, yeah. Uh, Hall's viewpoint keeps you on edge at all times while Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid keep riding. So, yeah, and. There are these sudden quick zooms on a subject of interest. There were maybe one or two that I felt didn't quite work, but the rest of the time it really does work. I I was not expecting that kind of thing in you know a, a western from back then. And and you know today I've I've seen many, you know, mostly it's in movies that are explicitly like from start to finish, handheld. You know, there there are quick zooms in Man of Steel, for example. Um, I I want to say, yeah, the, I suppose they're not quite as dramatic, but there are some in the Bourne movies as well. But you know, yeah, the the level of drama they, they that they are here is also in something like Man of Steel. So. Today we've we've seen it a bunch of times, but back then it was very unusual. And yeah, I I don't know if this was the first movie to do it, but certainly you know they did it and it worked really well here. That brings us to the editing. John C. Howard, R.I.P. And I think this is the only yeah he he edited seventeen movies between sixteen. Oh yeah, this was the first movie he edited. Uh, apparently, and the last one was in '83, and this is the only. Oh, he he edited High Anxiety, the the um, Mel Brooks movie. I gotta watch that. And History of the World Part. Oh, right, wait, how did I miss? Yeah, yeah, he edited Young Frankenstein and Silent Movie, which are both excellent. I love Silent Movie. And he edited Blazing Saddles. History of the World Part 1 is also really well edited. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know, there are a couple of Mel Brooks movies that I haven't watched yet, but, you know, I'm looking for them on sale. So, yeah. But, but yeah, it's really no surprise that, yeah, he's... Editing is one of the most important parts of movie comedies. And he really excelled at it. Like, there's, there, it's no wonder that, yeah, honestly, like, that's the thing people sometimes forget about Mel Brooks. He's actually, like, he, he himself makes parody movies, but he likes movies and he loves movies in general. Like, he helped produce The Fly, you know, the Cronenberg movie, because he was like, no, this, this looks good. I want, you know, and, and he, He's. I, I think he was actually part of how it got made because that was kind of a tall ask, you know. No, no, no. Let's let's give this really like obviously they were gonna make more than one The Fly, you know. They they made like three back in the '60s. I want to say, you know. So yeah, of course they were gonna make more. Let's give it to that guy who like freaks out people with his extreme gore and body horror. No, 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 that's, that'll be fine. That'll, that's going to be a great idea. Let's throw a lot of money at 
that, you know, and yeah, it's one of his best movies. It's easily his most mainstream movie, but it is also one of his best. You know, I honestly, I feel like Videodrome is probably the only, I, I haven't watched them all, but of the ones I've watched, Videodrome is the only one that is better than, than that movie. And yeah, you know, but Mel Brooks probably watched this movie and was like, that's really great editing, and hired him for, okay, so it's one, two, three, four, five different of his parody movies, you know, spanning, oh, right, yeah, he really cranked them out, spanning seven years. I was about to say, that was really, no, that's not actually that long, but yeah, he, you know, he, he certainly had, uh, um, you know, a chunk of Mel Brooks's career there in, in 70s and 80s, he really kept pushing them out like nothing. And it's it's remarkable that they're all, you know, again, haven't watched High Anxiety, haven't watched Blazing Saddles, but yeah. Um, yeah, I, I can understand, based on the editing of this, why he also felt like, yeah, this guy can definitely do parody editing. So, but but yeah, it also works really well for the the more dramatic parts. And, right, it was also, you know, it was also edited by Richard C. Meyer, R.I.P., who edited 25 movies between 1955 and 1986. And I think, yeah, this is, this is the only of, of the ones that he edited, that I've watched. Yeah, yeah, they, uh, it would be pretty wild if they left the editing of the entire movie to, to a guy who hadn't edited before. Uh, you know, Richard C. Meyer had edited a bunch of movies, like, what is that, over 15, as far as I can tell, before this movie, so, yeah. But, yeah, I don't know who's responsible for, for which, you know, parts, but, yeah, there's... This this is really well edited. I have a critic quote. Hill also uses editors John C. Howard and Richard C. Myers' quick cuts in his editing to make the audience jump, like the Sundance first quick draw of rapid firing bullets or the train explosions. There are several sequences in this movie that are stylized differently. The movie never risks getting repetitive when it comes to that aspect of the editing. I'm I'm really impressed. That like if I watch these sequences, if, if, like, let's say that someone had, like, ten different clips, showed all of them to me, and among them were these different sequences, and I hadn't watched the movie before, I might not have guessed that they were from the same movie, you know, and somehow it makes it work. Like, it doesn't feel like, oh, now, I guess that movie's just over, and we're never gonna get that, you know, it changes over the course of it, but in ways that are, in my personal opinion, not so drastic that you end up, like, yeah, just with a completely different movie. I'm, I'm not a big fan of when movies just change, and obviously, if I give any examples, it's going to spoil those movies. Um, I suppose I could say some of the movies by Danny Boyle, a director I love, some of his movies change dramatically, and I, yeah, it's, it's not, you know, I love those movies because he's such a talented director, but, you know, sometimes I find myself watching a movie and, you know, re-watching it over and over, and by the time I get to the part, I'm like, huh, yeah, okay, now that part of the movie's over. I kind of would have liked to see what the entire movie was going to be like if it didn't change so drastically, but okay. So this is not a special effects heavy movie, but the ones there are are good. You know, you have squibs on, you know, like you can tell when someone shoots an object and there's, yeah, explosions and, and such. And yeah, you know, they, they do a good job with them. Some, some directors who know what they're doing with drama and or comedy don't know how to do effects, and, you know, yeah, honestly, they, they probably, was this back when they did, was this maybe a second unit 
especially for explosions and so I'm, I'm not entirely sure but yeah whoever shot the special effects sequences did a really good job this is estimated as having a six million dollar budget and the box office was a hundred and two point three million so yeah you might call that a bit of a success sure and and yeah I completely understand it. like I back in 69 I might have watched this multiple times you know now that I yeah I just realized I did not mention that yet this is on Disney Plus at least here in Western Europe and because of that I was able to you know this is a movie that I've been told that I have to watch since I was like 12 years old you know so yeah uh, over 20 years by now and you know yeah for a while I was just like as soon as I find a really great deal on it but you know this was a movie that they tended to ask full price for because so many people want to watch it and now it's on Disney Plus so I'm paying Disney the same amount of money whether I'm watching this or not so I might as well watch it and I yeah I absolutely loved it so yeah um, I, I guess I'll talk about when I, I usually talk about when I uh, might rewatch it when I get to the end of the review itself now this was filmed in Utah and Colorado Mexico New Mexico and yeah you know and and it really and Arizona and and it works really well that you know they they do a really great job of finding they they did a great job of finding places that just really um they have uh, they have a personality of their own and it like I've seen a lot of westerns that did not have this variety of locations. And, right, according to Wikipedia, filming locations include the ghost town of Grafton, Zion National Park, Snow Canyon State Park, and the city of St. George. These areas remain popular film tourism destinations, including the Cassidy Trail in Reds Canyon. And I can completely understand, like, I'm not at all, um into film tourism myself but if I were this would definitely honestly this would like if I was anywhere near these locations you know I like I said live in Western Europe so I don't live near these places if I was like going to the basic area I'd wanna let's spend a little longer let's let's see where the the thing you know this and that thing happened in, in the movies yeah and yeah um, there is a major element in this movie that is very tense and suspenseful I don't want to give away what it is but by the time you have watched the entire thing I believe you will know what I'm talking about honestly yeah let, let me just put it in the so let's see and There we go. Okay. Um, so yeah. Um, as yeah, for for the the Western aspect, the the gunfight kind of thing is is fun, and there is some some great tension there as well. <sighs> I think some people, I forget if I've read reviews, but uh, yeah, yeah, the, oh, yeah, never mind, this is not a, a critical, let's see, it, yeah, um, yeah, I, I think some people might have been unhappy with, you know, I, I think we gotta get better as, as movie watchers at 
accepting when a movie is different from what we expected and just going with it because we you know i i try to be good about it today but i will admit like when i was a teenager there were definitely movies i watched some incredible movies and i didn't understand them at all because they were not the way i was used to movies being and just yeah the western stuff i thought was extremely entertaining and yeah sometimes really tense and and exciting but yeah there are definitely there are some parts where you think it's gonna go one way and it goes in a completely different direction and yeah um it, it is definitely you know it's definitely a case where you you have to be yeah so that brings us to the music so Bert Bacharach is the listed as the composer for this and he has 29 movie credits but some of them are music videos so uh yeah but the um, i think this is the only movie that i watched that he did the composing for but yeah, you know, um, I quite liked the the soundtrack. There, you know, right here on YouTube for free, you can listen to 21 minutes of it. And yeah, uh, let's see. Right, a critic quote: "The soundtrack to Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid is classic tunes from 1969. The songs fit the film with an easy personality, like a breeze of air grasping the characters as well as the atmosphere." The score from composer Burt Bacharach is charming and encompasses a chill vibe that keeps you either in still suspense or relaxed like the two at ease heroes. Yeah, some, some people say the soundtrack may have been popular but is a bit incongruous to the goings-on. I thought that really worked. I, I really felt like the, there's this interesting contrast that really just... Because, yeah, in a way, like, this is, you know, this easygoing music that sometimes really fits. Because the duo, the titular duo, don't take very many things very seriously. So it's essentially their internal soundtrack. And we're watching the movie and we're like, um, that, that thing might be really dangerous. You might want to take, you know, and they're just chilling. And, and it's just, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, and, and yeah, some people felt it was very, the you know, some of the music was very odd, you know, yeah, oddly chosen, and yeah, for, for sure, if, if you, if you can't, um, if it doesn't work for you, it's definitely going to annoy you, that will, I'm definitely, yeah. Now, let's see. Okay, so, yeah, on pacing, I have a user review quote here. The movie starts well, would be great if it kept that energy throughout. Middle of the movie is its weakest part. The last third is unconvincing and forced. And, yeah, he says the, the let's see, um, yeah, the, the score is dated 60s, kind of, yeah. I I see what they mean, but I just middle of the movie. I suppose the the middle is not. I wouldn't I wouldn't use the word weak, but it maybe is like if I were to, you know. So yeah, divide the movie into thirds. The the middle is maybe the the lesser of the three, but I don't think it's bad. If if that. Yeah, um, yeah. The movie is an hour and fifty minutes long without end credits, and like I mentioned, the, the credits are at the start, so it's only one additional minute with the end credits. And let's see if you. I would say to give the movie 
until about 40 minutes in. If the let's see, is that the actually maybe tell you what, 45 minutes. If you give the movie 45 minutes, if by that point you are not interested in what happens afterwards, go ahead and turn off the movie. I it's not really gonna but but by then the movie has taken off as it were and yeah so the best element yeah I'm gonna have to um, I can't pick just one so the best elements are tied between the the friendship between Butch and the kid the the this this interesting way that the the comedy and drama can can coexist without either of them completely you know the movie being just yeah um and just the the yeah how charming the the movie is and and how fun how exciting how different it is from so many other westerns now, I guess, uh, yeah, in, in some ways it is problematic and that is the, the worst aspect of it to me. To others, you know, others thought that it wasn't engaging enough and the uneven tone ruined it for some people. And yeah, without a doubt, the thing I was, uh, I suppose, yeah, I already mentioned that I don't really, I, I, that was not my experience, but for sure, you know, if you're watching this right now, you haven't watched the movie yet, it might be your experience, so just be aware of that. The thing I was most worried about was, without a doubt, that it would not live up to its reputation, and it absolutely exceeded it, like, yeah, I, this, this is a, and this is, honestly, this is a movie if I had watched this when I, the, if the first time I watched this, if I was seven years old, I would probably have loved it. Sixteen, loved it. Twenties, loved it. And now, in my mid-thirties, loved it, you know. And, yeah. Um, I, I could try to find people older than I to show it to, but most of them have probably either already watched it or have completely written off ever watching it, but yeah, you know, I, I'll admit there, you know, there are certain things about it that I, that, that wouldn't work the same depending on age, but just the, the charm of it, you know, yeah, you know, even, even, and, and this is essentially like, Let's see, I'm going to really quickly look up the IMDb Parents Guide and see what others have said as far as the... So, you know, it's it's PG... Uh, let's see... There is definitely some stuff that will bother... You know, if, if, you, if you're a parent, you know... At, at the very least, read through the parents' guide before showing it to your children. Um, yeah, there, there are definitely there's there's some language and let's see. Yeah, some some people found the the violence to be moderate. I'm not sure I would go that far, but there is some, let's see, yeah, you know, uh, I, I would, let's see, what, what is PG again, that's like, oh right, I guess that's basically any age, but parental, parents should, well, should be aware of what's in it before, um, yeah, I think, you know, like a nine-year-old would probably be, be fine for this. And let's see, yeah, the 
I was most looking forward to experiencing a classic, and again, the movie exceeded my expectations. You know, if this movie wasn't already, you know, everyone has already watched it, I would be going around telling people they, they gotta watch it. Now, there is... Uh, I've, I've only found one trailer. It gave away at least a little too much, I do think, but, you know, this is pretty typical for movies of... You know, if you, if you watch, like... Hitchcock trailers from the 60s is also like, I guess they just wanted people to know the entire movie, which is, to be fair, there's also some, there's a lot of that today in, in movie trailers, but I feel like there was like a sweet spot for a while, I, I can't completely place when, but was it, was it always as bad as it is right now? Anyway, but, but yeah, you know, the, the trailer, it's fine it it gives you an okay idea of what the movie is like but you know it's very it's very much a trailer from back then you know ha has anybody made a i'm going to really quickly check cuz it this this really is completely ah what's the word this this uh, let's see modern trailer would make a ton of sense to make. Nah, no, no, hasn't been done. So if anybody's watching this who makes those, you know, consider that a request, because this really is a movie that just yeah. Um, let's see. You know, if yeah, if you're not used to trailers from the '60s, don't watch the trailer for this. Just you know, look look at a little bit of you know, yeah, t talk to people who've watched it and who know your movie tastes. Don't watch the trailer if you're not used to it, because it's definitely going to make you not want to watch it based on the, yeah, I'm used to 60s trailers, so t for me, I was like, oh, another 60s trailer. And let's see, yeah, the the, the cover and the poster also give too much away but yeah just try not to think about what what's in there because you may well have already seen yeah um yeah this was this was also one of those movies where there was not a huge amount of you know here here on YouTube like I found five clips from the movie several reviews a few documentaries about the real events you know, let's see. Yeah, technically there is more than one trailer, but I think all of them were from back then. Some some reaction reaction videos. So, yeah, I would like to say that's part of why I felt obliged to do a video on it. But honestly, I probably would have done a video even if there were you know a ton of YouTube videos already. Once I had made the decision, I was gonna so. And, yeah, I know, honest to a fault, sometimes. Yeah, this has an 89% on the tomato meter, which makes it certified fresh. And the audience, right, based on 54 reviews, 48 of them are fresh. And a 92 audience score based on over 50,000 ratings. And the average critic rating was 8.30 out of 10, the average... Critic of uh, the average user rating was 4.3 out of 5. Yeah, yeah, 92% rated it 3.5 or higher out of 5. So, yeah, and you know, and and uh, again, like if you didn't like it, that's that's fine, that doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It's it isn't for everyone on Metacritic. The critic rating is 66 out of 100, and the user rating is 8.6 out of 10. And let's see, there are 13 Metacritic reviews, 20 user reviews, and on IMDb, it has, let's see, 8.0 out of 10. And let's see. Right there. Are, wow. Did I? I gotta double check that. There's only 467 
user reviews for this movie, even though it's so beloved. That, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, I forget if I read all of them or yeah, no, I probably just read the the one the the one hundred top voted ones, and their ratings. There were three one out of ten ratings, two two out of two ratings, four three out of ten ratings, eight four out of ten ratings, thirteen five out of ten, five six out of ten, nine seven out of ten, seven. 8 out of 10, 17, 9 out of 10, and 33, 10 out of 10. So yeah, this is... Actually, yeah, there, there are still some relatively low, but yeah, by and large, this is very positively... Yeah. I feel bad for the numerous critics who wrote Guess I'm Alone about disliking the film in the top 100, considering that their appearance means they're not alone. I'm to be should really email you when one of your reviews do especially well in that regard. And yeah, there were 113 links in the IMDb external review section, and 73 of them work and were in English. And yeah, 212,544 IMDb users have given a weighted average vote of 8.0 out of 10. So 33% gave 8, voted 8. 22% voted 9, 15.7 voted 10, 18.2 voted 7, 6.1 voted 6, 2.3 voted 5, and the rest of the votes are all under 1%. So, yeah, this is this is not only a very very well-liked movie, it is a very like percentage-wise you know, either not very many people disliked it, or not, or, or very few people felt like they could be completely honest with disliking it. And let's see. that brings us to so yeah. Um, if you you know, on on. Disney Plus, I can just briefly go over the suggested movies for this are Davy Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier, Davy Crockett and the River Pirates, Old Yeller, The Alamo, The Newton Boys, Tombstone Patton, and Bad Girls. And I gotta admit, most of those I haven't watched. Uh, the Alamo is good, not amazing. Tombstone is amazing. I don't think I've watched any of the other ones, but yeah, so, you know, the, the, certainly, I've heard that Patton is amazing, and I feel like I've heard Newton Boys is also really, really good. I certainly, that is a very persuasive cast. Matthew McConaughey, Skeet Ulrich, even Hawk, Dwight Yoakam, Vincent D'Onofrio, holy crap, okay. Uh, I'm going to have to look, unless that movie is terrible, I'm definitely watching it. Uh, I'm going to have to, yeah, I'm just going to note, there we go. And there, but but yeah, um, I'm not sure that Disney is the, Disney Plus has a huge amount of westerns. It's not something where I've really found, like, I guess I could do a real quick search for Leone. And it does not have a... S oh, oh, wait. Once Upon a Time in America, which is for sure an amazing movie. But that seems to be the only, the only movie they have. So, you know, it's not the best place to go for westerns. Uh, let's see. Then there's Ford. Um, yeah. Not seeing... Me for Wayne. Okay, a search for for Wayne does game. Yeah, I I don't know if other people are having this issue, but if I try to type more than one word into the 
Disney Plus search on the not on the app. On the app it works, you know, with no problem. But in a in a browser, then it can't get more than the the first word. So I usually just search by last name. Um, I guess Eastwood is also a good. Yeah. Um, nothing as far as I can say. Yeah, yeah. So not the best place to go for, you know, I'm sure there are other streaming services that are better for Westerns. And it also has no extras, but in my experience, that's pretty common for Disney Plus for movies that are, you know, a bit older. Now, yeah, uh, you know, here in Western Europe, you can watch on Disney Plus. I'm not sure if that's true outside of Western Europe. So some other places you can watch it. Uh, let's see, Spectrum TV, T Watch TCM, Prime Video, Apple TV, Vudu, Vudu Movie, and TV Store or Redbox. And yeah, that's that's it. So yeah, um, this is where I rate the movie. So I'm going to start by saying I might watch this again later today. Um, I guess if I have to be completely objective, I am giving it an 8 out of 10. But this is my video, my channel, so I don't have to only be objective. Personally, I give this 10 iconic duos out of 10. And again, you know, not saying it's perfect, but the strengths so greatly outweigh the weaknesses. And that brings us to the spoiler section. So this, uh, yeah, the last, the last two sections of this video are the thoughts section. So the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some is MST, 3K, riff tracks, and other jokes. And yeah, so the, the first section is notes taken while watching. You know, they're in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. And the section after that is thoughts that I had before watching. So those are things that I wrote down based on what I had heard and read about the movie that I wanted to comment on. And uh, I'm just going to note the time code and then we dive in to notes taken while watching. I quite like, uh, you know, the, the, yeah, Butch standing in the, the closing bank, watching intently the money being moved into the vault, and, you know, the, there's that exchange about, you know, what happened to the old bank? People kept robbing it, uh, you know, and I didn't realize when I watched the Paul W. Anderson movie, Which I don't. Uh, wow, I don't even. Right now, I don't even remember its name. Um, I'm gonna. Oh right, shopping, with dollar signs. And yeah, that in that movie he has the the character. You know, yeah, he also has some characters. Say, you know, a, a variation of that line, not not verbatim, and. Yeah, um, I don't think it's always a problem to take inspiration. You know, they, they say that good artists steal from the best artists, but I think it's noteworthy that in that movie, the, the titch, the, uh, not titular, but the duo that we focus on are significantly less like, they're, they're really not particularly likable, they're really obnoxious. You know, where in this movie they are incredibly likable, and that goes a long way towards making a line like that either really work or really not. Because, you know, when I watched the movie, I didn't particularly like that, and I didn't even know that he stole it from a much better movie then. But obviously, you know, when you've watched enough Paul W. Anderson, you start to suspect, oh, that was actually kind of good. I wonder what movie he stole it from. I love the tension of the card game, and for how much of it they don't cut, at first they don't even move the camera. It's just this close-up of Sundance, and just, yeah. 
as as gradually you know for, first it's you know we see that Sundance wins and he's you know maintaining a poker face he's not like yes again you know kind of rubbing their noses in it but you know gradually it's you know there's the let's see I th yeah it's the it's the there's the one other one other card player is like you play really good and I know that because I play really well as well yeah, I know not verbatim I don't remember verbatim so and you know he accuses him of cheating and the the you know this thing of Sundance oh wow I am at this point just reset no you know what I'm I'm just gonna say I thought it was really really great how they you know and when they finally decide to cut they cut to a shot of the other guy and he's like oh no you know and yeah and when the guy finds out that it was Sundance that he accused he regrets it and you know the, the Sundance is is willing to leave without any further you know no, no no it's okay it's okay you didn't know you didn't know it's fine and then you know the guy is like are you really as good of a shot as they say and he proves it so that's yeah and the let's see yeah, yeah while the the duo were away were away the gang turned on them and let's see yeah and and butch tries to talk them back down but you know nope it's gonna there's gonna be a knife fight and just you know the, the uh, i i really like this this subversion of expectation where you know it's it's a western so you know so, oh okay this is there's a fight. There's going to be a, a, a fight. You know, it's going to be, you know, dramatic and violent and, and such. And you know, he like he makes sure to, like he says, let's let's start by squaring out the rules. And I think the big guy's named Logan. Rules. There's no rules in a knife fight and kick to the nads. And it, you know, and and then yeah, and then. Butch is like, oh well, okay. Uh, someone count one, two, three, go. One, two, th and and Sundance counts, and then he, you know, easily takes out, you know, numbnuts Logan, you know, numbnuts both because of the kick, and because he was stupid enough to not see where that was going, even though he's known Butch for years. And and I also like, you know, before it starts, you know. Let's, yeah, what, uh, I forget who, but one of them is like, but you always said any one of us could challenge you for leadership. Yeah, that's because I didn't think any of you actually would, you know, and, and he turns to, to Sundance. I don't mean to be a sore loser, but if I, if I die, kill him. Glad to. And yeah, Butch is easily made leader again. And, you know, now... Yeah, and, and once he is leader again, he's fine with Harvey's idea. Sure, we can do that. And let's see. I, I really like this line of, um, you know, he's trying to talk, uh, I, yeah, I believe it's Butch, trying to talk Woodcock out of the, you know, yeah, out of the train into letting them in. And he's like, do you think that E.H. would die for you? You know, setting up this thing of, like, rich versus poor, where, you know, rich people, they're fine hiring poor people to do the dangerous things for them, but they don't actually, yeah, they, they don't care about them. And, let's see. Yeah, and, and this thing of, you know, the martial is really struggling to get people to, to fight and you know both the titular duo and the movie itself don't really care about the marshal the, the, you know he's not being taken seriously by the characters who are like so close they can hear what he's saying and the movie which keeps cutting away from his speech to to you know more of the shtick basically you know it's not cutting to to the titular duo to make sure oh you you really can't miss this no it's just you know <laughs> was the thing the the you know when they think that 
they're fine. The, oh wait, no, no, I'm thinking of the later scene with Sweet Face. A anyway, yeah, you know, it's it's once again, I love the shtick, but it's yeah, it's it's not cutting away to for something that we absolutely have to see. Let's see, and yeah, and and the bicycle salesman takes advantage of the the um what's it called. You know, he's like, well, you already got the crowd here, and they're more interested. Like, we we specifically see and hear, they're really not very, you know, first he asks, okay, who here has a gun? And cuts to the crowd, and I don't think a single person raises their hand. He's like, uh, okay, who here would like me to supply him with a gun? And it cuts, and no one, you know, just absolutely nothing. He is, like, just... Get off the stage! You're not funny! Just completely bombing. And the bicycle salesman is like, well, you already got the crowd. You are getting nothing from these people. And he's like, okay, so look at this thing. And they're like, wow! You know, and, and he's like standing there saying, the horse is dead. I the moment he said that, I was like, oh god, he's gonna he, they're gonna like freak out. Well, my horse is dead! But no, you know, it just uh, Maybe that was one of the was that one of the big laughs that the director cut because let's be honest, people at the time were not great on metaphor, you know. I, yeah. Anyway, and the let's see. Yeah. Um. So so you know we see that the titular duo and the bicycle salesman the the crowd they have this kind of anti-serious consequence-free vibe you know they're not used to like the this this idea that they're gonna go hunt down these two because because they know you know it's not like it's a rumor they know butch cassidy and the sundance kid have been robbing trains for a long time everybody knows about them so he's not like trying to convince them that there's a you know there's secretly an alien out there who's you know, no no it's just like we all know them. We all know of them, at least. Not everybody has met them, but everybody's heard of them, at the very least. And don't we see, uh, I forget when in the movie, but there's a point where we see, like, wanted posters. Oh, wait, that's that's Bolivia. Um, but, but yeah, you know, and just nothing. None of them are, are interested. And let's see. Yeah, and, and after Sundance tells Etta to take off her clothes, it revealed they are together, not strangers. You know, she's like, I wish you would be here on time, you know, and the, the, yeah, um, I've read, I, I read at least one female viewer thought that the scene was incredibly, like, appealing, so I'm just going to, I'm, I really, really like that it does end up showing that they are together. You know, it's just, it's basically role play, you know, and that's not, that's not a bad thing, you know. So, yeah, I, I think, and I, yeah, I, th I think the, the movie knows that. I, do, I don't think we would keep being, keep liking them if they did, actually. Like, Later, there's Agnes, Cloris Leachman, and she's really, you know, she's talking him up, like, just... If he ever needed a wingman, he should just bring her, you know, so just, she's talking up how amazing he is, how much, you know, she likes him way better than the other guys, so just, you know, yeah. These are not, they're, they don't treat women badly, and that's a really important thing, and that is something that, you know, sadly... Back then, there was, you know, basically the harshest, you know, they, they, they do take the, the, you know, the, the large, the plus-sized train uh, passenger. They, they, like, take her hostage. Other than that, they don't really, the, their violence is almost always and exclusively directed towards men. You know, there's that part where Sundance says to Etta, if you whine, we'll leave you there, you know, but that's, yeah, and that is obviously harsh, but it's, it's not anywhere near as bad as, yeah.
personally, I I think the raindrops keep falling on my head scene works for the movie. Uh, you know, I know some people hate it. I did quite like that. You know, it ends with Butch crashing the bike. That's what happens when you don't pay attention. You know, he's like riding it backwards to show off, and he crashes it. It's, that was yeah. You know, and and the zoom in on on the on the cow. Not a big fan. I I thought that was a little too goofy. I thought that was just. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, I, I didn't hate that, you know, it goes to a close-up of the cow making, you know, ca cows don't have the most expressive faces, and then it, you know, cuts to a close-up of uh, a Butch, and he, you know, imitates its face, and then, you know, walks up, you know, that, that part was fine, but a zoom-in on the, that I did not think particularly worked, but... You know, I don't know, maybe it played better in 69. Now, let's see. And, yeah, and I, you know, I like that they're, you know, yeah, in general, in the scene, they are playing. You know, the, um, Edda throws some hay at, at Butch. You know, it's, it's not just that she's sitting there and watching him do this, no, they're they're playing together. You know, he's he's showing off on the bike, and she throws the hay at him to, to you know see if he'll crash. Uh, you know, yeah, it's it's a mutual thing. And I like that you know the second time Butch talks. You know, they they stop the train and they hear the voice from inside. And they're like, "Woodcock, is that you? Why, yes, Butch, it is." You know, and just. How how are you? Ah, uh, you know, I'm 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 okay, I guess. Can, why, why don't you open the door? Take you know, let us take a look at you. I really like that the movie makes sure we see he was about to open the door, and then he stops and really, and and then he makes sure to say, "Now nah, you wouldn't think I was I would actually fall for something like that," you know, and just yeah, he was about he was about to open the door, forgetting that he's just yeah. And the the thing with you know he's like no look I'm he uh, I'm still employed by Mr. E H what was it Her Harrigan or something like that and you know I'm being paid to make sure you don't get through this door and you know the the plus size woman walks out I'm not afraid of anything I'm a grandmother and a female I've got my rights badass and you know. Later, you know, it's, it's revealed that she's being imitated afterwards. She herself never actually begs. You know, of course, we're meant to laugh at her. But, yeah, so that is Jody Gilbert, R.I.P. And, yeah, she did an incredible job. I really, really liked, yeah, you know, if I were to rewrite something, I would have liked for her to, like, maybe chase them away so they're not able to, to steal from that train and then the posse comes after them or something. But... Yeah, I, I did really appreciate that they have her actually, you know, that's gutsy. Like, they, they've got guns, and she's like, I don't care. You know, she, what was, she said something like, I fought alcoholism, and just, you know, yeah. And yeah, and the other train pulls up, and the horsemen following the titular duo spread. I, I thought that was a really great reveal. Like you can tell, okay, the movie just took a turn. This is no longer; they are no longer in complete control. You know, up to this point, they've basically never been like. Even when there's like, you know, I know you cheated at cards, or I'm gonna take a knife, I'm gonna fight you to the death for control over the gang. It's still like, okay, you know, it, pretty quickly, we realize they're not, you know, they're going to be okay. Say the words. And then, with the horses, you know, just, yeah, it's it's like, it's like you cut a, a yeah, it just, it's, you know, these horses just come, come like, it's also the way it's shot, like, it looks especially dramatic, that they're just, piling out of the the just yeah 
and yeah, they have to make a run for it, and I really like, you know, Butch grabs Sweetface and says, I know, you're a dirty no-good liar, but who would know from looking at your sweet face, you know, from looking at your face. And so, yeah, he get him to, to lie to the posse. And at first, you know, it seems to convince. And, the you know, they're like, okay, you know, the, the yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Kid Sundance is like, I'm, you know, don't worry, I'm leaving. You can have sex without me, you know. And then they realize, oh, the posse came back. And we get a dramatic zoom in on Sweet Face as he points directly at just that. That was really great. I really loved just, you know, oh, wow, that did not go well at all. And and it's specifically being shot from their point of view. Their, not, not quite a POV shot, but their vantage point. And just, yeah. Let's see... Uh, I really love that we, like the duo, don't know what's going on with the horsemen. You know, it's it's a little while before they they figure who it must be. Let's see. Yeah, the the um. Let's. See. Oh right, I'll get some. Yeah. So the yeah the sheriff insists that they cuff and gag him because. It's like, okay, what if someone saw? They would realize that I'm not really trying to catch you. And, you know, he tells them it's over. And he even apologizes. Okay, I'm getting mean in my old age. But, you know, it's over. They keep being told that, you know, things are over. Things are over for the duo. Things are over for a certain age of the Old West. And they keep not accepting that. Uh, I think, let's see. Yeah, later there's even the, the thing with, you know, they, they get rid of the, the bike, which was a symbol of the future. And they, you know, yeah, they, they leave it behind. They show it no respect. They don't even resell it. They just, you know, shove it off and it falls. And cam the camera specifically shows it shows us it lying there in the water, having been completely rejected by them. They don't want this thing. And, yeah, you know, it, obviously it's not that the, you know, this is not like the, the ring video. There's not a curse on the bike. So that's why they die. But it's metaphorical, in my opinion, that they are rejecting. They're, they refuse to change with the times. And everything that stays the same for long enough eventually dies. And let's see. Yeah, so you know, Sundance realizes it must be Lord Baltimore after them. I really, really like that we never get a close up. It's not even Lord Baltimore. Like the the army is what catches up to them. The the Bolivian army, you know, eventually. Because at the end of the day, like as as much as as Lord Baltimore is, you know, creates a lot of tension for them before they leave for Bolivia. Ultimately, you know, why is Lord Baltimore after them? Because they keep robbing the same places. You know, they're not they're not quite careful enough, and they just they refuse to settle down. That's even you know near very close to the end. Etta points out, you know, we could do you could do this, you could do that, and they just they won't. And, yeah, they reach the water, and turns out, you know, Sunday can't swim. Later we find out um, Butch has never shot anybody before, you know. And, yeah, I, I quite like that element. Um, and, yeah, like the, the critic noted, it seems to suggest they're, you know, yeah, they're, they're friends, but they, you know, they're like... Um, mentally still 16. They they don't behave as adult friends who've been together for years. Let's see. And, and you know, the various things with trying to, you know, I, if I jump into the water, I can't swim, I'll drown. The fall will kill you regardless, you know, this thing. And, and once they're in the water, even there, they get into a fight and just, yeah. I... I yeah, 
it it cracks me up every single time they fight and we get this these fades and pans of stills in in sepia and you know there's there's music there's no dialogue and that's how we get to bolivia i really like this stylistic choice you know and and yeah it goes back to color once they're there and yeah i i really you know so so yeah there's the there's the opening with the with the with the silent film in sepia tone then we have the 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 fades and pans of stills to to get to bolivia then we have the the montage let's see which is also without dialogue of them ah uh, instead of them robbing maybe I, some something like that once they're in bolivia you know just yeah the the i i thought they they you know they did a really great job let's be honest if if they didn't montage us through some of these robberies it would get ridiculously tedious because if we actually stop I'm, I'm not going to but hypothetically if one were to sit down and just like write you know make, make a make a quick um, make a cross on a piece of paper every single time we see them in a new you know in, in a new in, not always a new place but in a new robbery like there's a there's a lot of that so they had to make it interesting you know and yeah we find they do not like Bolivia when they reach there and you know I quite like both of them have a certain amount of logic in their thinking because I want to say it's Butch who's like not all of Bolivia looks like this which is a that's a that's a logical statement that's a very logical standpoint to take we've we've been here for a very short amount of time we've only seen one place the entire country is not going to look exactly like this. And then, you know, Sundance points out, maybe people ride for ages just to get here. Maybe this is the most amazing place in all of Bolivia. You know, that's also true. That's entirely possible. It might be way worse the other places. So, yeah. And you know they go in they try to rob their first bank and they didn't know enough spanish to to rob the bank so yeah and they struggle to learn and even in in bed and in the robbery itself i i quite liked you know again that's that's very effective cutting and actually yeah at the time i thought it was especially funny but thinking back it was also kind of like it was really showing this is a fundamental, like, if they can't communicate with the people they're trying to steal from, you know, it's going to go wrong. And they didn't, they really were not prepared. You know, I mean, they could have been practicing Spanish all the way to Bolivia, but apparently they barely had. Like, she taught them a couple of things, and they guess kind of thought they knew and then when they get in there they can't get a word out the the first time you know and yeah i i thought it was quite fun you know they're sitting there they're eating and and you know butch is struggling through what what he has and you know at a it, it, school teacher you know she's like okay that was yours now you say you know just very very um like like a good, um, yeah, like a like a good teacher. Just you know, she's she's not like yelling at them when they get things wrong. She's just okay. That was that was fine. Now the next thing is, you know, so just yeah. That was and and even in bed, I forget which of them, but one of them is lying on top of her, and she's still like, now when you want, you know, yeah. And they actually they they do like a. a dialogue match cut where she's saying uh, I don't I'm I don't think it was hands up but I'm just going to go okay so at the at the table hands up cuts them in bed hands up you know just even even then you know it's it's not a particularly romantic situation and and you know knocking on the on the wall are you still awake okay now you say that yeah that's there you go and and moving on just yeah and 
and they're chased, but they hide in a tree and shoot even Etta, it seems. Certainly, she was revealed to be a good shot in the fade pan sequence, so, yeah. And they get to the safe, rob the bank. I, I quite like, you know, they're like, you know, no, big deal, you know, we... We, we would like to deposit something in the safe, you know, and it's completely wordless, but from faces we can tell, you know, that, like, you know, the guy out front is, is like, trying to help them, and then the, the guy behind, like, overhears, holy crap, this is a big deal, you know, I gotta treat him right, so he opens the door, and big smile, you know, come on in, we get, yeah, oh, you know, so grateful that you're choosing our, our bank, please come in, it's right this way, okay, so here we have the vault, let me just unlock and open the gate okay the vault you know open you know does the does the things you have to do to open the vault you know big smile open the door and then he you know as he's opening the door he sees the gun he's like oh. <laughs> you know um sad trombone noise to quote the editing room and just yeah um so they get everything that's in in the vault that was that was quite funny and let's see the um, yeah and you know they try to go straight they try to guard the the gold from for this guy from other robbers and uh, you know the the you know at first he's like okay so shoot that and you know no, no just stand still and you know, oh, can i move okay and then he you know nails it and he's like i shoot better when i move and then, you know, they're, they're trying to spot an ambush and like, oh, I'm working with morons. No one's going to ambush us because we don't have a lot of money, you know. And and isn't he then immediately proven wrong because that's when they're ambushed, I think? Anyway. And, yeah. I'm, I guess I'll go ahead and call him Colorful too. He's shot and the duo, you know, are, are also shot at and they, they grab the money and toss it. And then they, you know, go away from there because, that, you know, there's no reason to shoot them now. They got the money, you know. And then they come back and struggle to, to say in, in Spanish, the money isn't ours. We, we're we paid, you know, we're being paid to take it back. You know, and, and I I didn't understand every single word, but I'm almost certain that one of the, the Bolivians said in Spanish, we know the money isn't yours, it's ours, and then big laugh, and the entire gang really laughs. So that's that's pretty funny. You gotta admit that you know, it's almost too bad that they didn't understand Spanish better, because that I think they'd appreciate that joke. And yeah, you know it it the the let's see as yeah as they're talking about who to shoot, you know that's when I want to say it's Butch who admits you know he's never actually shot. A person before you know he's a he's a good shot sure but there's a difference between shooting a target and shooting a person and knowing that person might die you know and ultimately they do you know they, they shoot all of them they leave with the, the the gold but yeah again you know very very tense and yeah actually yeah there was this uh, let's see now I can quote the critic yeah if you expect a lot of gunfights, you are mistaken on this one. Of what there is in the movie, they are short and well placed. I really love the the shootings in in this movie. They're so they're always so exciting and and you know it, yeah. Some of the time they were exciting, some of the time they were funny. But there's they always get a reaction. I was never like oh good more gunfire. You know I've I've watched movies where it's like can we just stop with the guns already? It's not it's no longer fun to watch. And you, you have to work really hard to get there, because I do quite like movies with guns. Not guns in real life, but yeah. And yeah, you know, Etta points out we could do farming, maybe start a ranch. And, you know, they point out, don't know how to farm. Ranching is a really, really hard work. You have to start when you're young. You can't start at our age, you know. And yeah, you know, she, she realizes, no, oh, this is... You're gonna end up dead, and she leaves. And let's see. Yeah, yeah. It's but you know, it's too late for them to change. But if they if they don't change, they die, and that is what the movie ends with. And we have this, you know, it's actually it's shown in this really romanticized version, you know, rather than 
you know, really underlying, you know, basically, like, the way I see it, even in their death, they did not accept that they can't, you know, they, they if you keep doing this same, you know, it, what is that thing, live by the sword, die by the sword, you know, if you keep doing the same violent, dangerous thing, yeah, you know, and, and what was, was it, actually, wait, was it the very first scene they're together? I think when, the, yeah, the, the, uh, when, when Sundance has been cheating at cards, and he's, you know, he wants to shoot the other guy, and Butch comes in and says, look, Every day you wake up, you're a little older. That's just how it is. You can't, you know, you can't shoot your way out of every single situation. So, something like that. And let's see. Yeah, and and the horse. I guess the horse brand or something like that is is recognized by this this kid, and the, you know. Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, and the the um, ah, what's it called? Yeah, they're they're shot at, and at first it's like, well, there can't be that many, and they shoot a couple, and they, you know, yeah, they end up being um, what's it called? Like, basically, they're, they're trapped. You know, they're surrounded, and yeah, I gotta say, the the climax was really really exciting. I, holy crap, I, I was I was on the edge of my seat, and just yeah. And, you know, yeah, here at the end, they're both wounded, they're still arguing. And, you know, here, yeah, at the very end, some of the Bolivian, I'm, I'm guessing army, share with each other that these are the two Yankee bandits. You know, um, yeah, I'm not gonna, I, I would butcher the Spanish, so I'm not gonna, but, but yeah, the, they said, they, they repeat these words, you know, two Yankee bandits, dos Yankee bandidos. That, you know, we heard some of the people they were robbing earlier say, so they've made a name for themselves. This is the ultimate consequence of that. You know, that's, you, yeah, they did get away from Lord Baltimore, and they're far away from America. You know, there's a, they're, they're, yeah, Bolivia, that's, yeah, but they can't stop. They can't. They can't help themselves, you know, and just, yeah, I, I totally see what George Roy Hill meant by tragic. And, let's see, yeah, you know, the the duo know that they've lost. They're dying, and they're still arguing as they're talking about Australia, you know, and, and all this. And it's not even just, like, this... Like there's a there's a basic refusal to out to to say out loud we've lost. So instead, you know, you say, ah, so that's your idea. No, no, no. It's not the big idea. It's it's the last in a long line of great ideas. You know, they speak English. Yeah, but it's like really hot and sweaty, isn't it? And just you know, I just don't want to get there and be like, oh, it's so hot and sweaty here. You know, all these things just because because they. In my mind, they psychologically know, but they just, they can't say it out loud. You know, yeah, because even there was that other thing where they were sure that they had a situation handled, and then something goes wrong, and then one of them says, don't you get tired of being right all the time? You know, instead of saying, this is, this is horrible, you know, this, even, even their repeated mantra of who are those guys there's still this, like, you know, they're not saying those guys are going to be the end of us. They're just, you know, yeah. So, and it ends on yet another still frame fading to sepia tone. We don't see them gunned down, but obviously that is what happens. We hear all the gunfire. You know, they, they even, they, there's multiple volleys of gunfire, so, yeah, there's no question, you know, or I, actually, yeah, I suppose it would be completely fair to interpret it as that's the last people heard of them, but maybe one of, you know, maybe they didn't die there, maybe they, you know, yeah, I don't know, maybe they did eventually just accept, we have to accept, you know, we're getting older, and they just, 
you know, I don't know, starved to death, it, um, died of, ah, what's it called? Died of thirst, some something like that. You know, if I mean, if they kept, if they if they stopped robbing places, but they also didn't work a normal job. But but yeah, you know, either way, whether it was their literal death or the death, uh, not 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 the death of the legend, but the but the end of the legend. Whether it was their literal death or where the legend ended or stopped, because that was that was it. You know, they didn't. You know, they didn't grow old doing this dangerous thing. They didn't, you know, according to this. I, I, I'm I, honestly not that interested in the real events. And let's see. Yeah, you know, the, the camera zooms way out from the still image of them. Once again, very romanticized. And yeah, so yeah, the, the tense suspenseful element that... You know, in the review, I didn't want to give it away. You know, it's the posse and then later the army. The fact that, the you know, it is catching up to them. They they can't do this forever. And that brings us to the final section, notes taken before watching. So, um, let's see. Uh, is this a movie with sequels? I think that's right. They did, yeah, 10 years later, there was Butch and Sundance, The Early Days, Ugh, Richard Lester, 5.7 out of 10. So yeah, I'm guessing this was not a particularly, you know what, if you like Richard Lester, you know what, uh, yeah, I guess I can understand. I just think he was the wrong person to direct Superman. And I am not fond of his Three Musketeers movie. I, I've read the book. I really don't think it makes a lot of sense to go that goofy and, and silly with it. That's all. But let's see. Version 1 of The Beatles' Help. Oh, yeah, and A Hard Day's Night. Yeah, yeah. That he worked really well for. I think he did a good job on those. Um, but yeah, the music video for Help by the Beatles, and A Hard Day's Night, the entire movie from 1964. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah, I, I liked that when I watched it. And I would probably still like it if I tried watching it again today. But, um, yeah, anyway. So there is a single sequel which did not lead to any further sequels or let's see as far as I remember I'm just gonna double check yeah it did not lead to any further and there's there's a TV movie in 2004 and 56 right there were some spin-offs Mrs. Sundance wanted the Sundance woman wow yeah I mean um, that is, like, if there is one thing about this movie that I would definitely, I would have liked more of the, of Etta Place. Yeah, that is, that is who it's about. Oh, right, and Catherine Ross actually did play the role in the 76. Yeah, so it was, it was the director, it wasn't the role that she had a problem with. Yeah, I actually, I might, ah, only 5.6 out of 10 on IMDb. 6 out of 6.0 out of 10 on IMDb for Mrs. Sundance which was a TV movie Elizabeth Montgomery do I know oh RIP holy crap only 62 oh right bewitched I haven't watched bewitched but yeah that's what she's known for according to the yeah I knew the name I I don't think I've seen her in anything she also played Lizzie Borden. Cool. Well, I suppose it's not cool. She was a serial killer, but uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I, 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 the the idea of spinoffs focusing on on her I, that is kind of appealing. But other than that, I'm not super interested in in sequels to this. 
uh, or I guess even spiritual successors or predecessors for that matter. Um, yeah, okay, I, I think this is the kind of thing that, like, I like the idea. I like taking a story and saying this was the end of a certain thing. I don't think you can, like, yeah, I mean, yeah, you'd have to do it with a different movement or a different kind of thing. You, I, I don't want more, you know, okay, if you post down in the comments that there's similar westerns that are really, really good, maybe I'll, I'll watch, but... I'm not super interested in, yeah, like, other things are like, similar to this, the way that Unforgiven is also a, a unusual, an, an unusual Western which is doing something different, you know, and, and that is definitely, like, I also gave that one a 10 out of 10. That is, I do prefer that movie to this one, but that's not to say that this is in any way bad. Now, the, let's see, yeah, so, so... This is actually a little, um, yeah. According to IMDb Trivia, this film was filmed, this movie was filmed roughly at the same time as Hello, Dolly, also from 69, on the soundstage next door. Director George Roy Hill believed that the studio would allow him to film the New York City scenes on Dolly's sets, since the two films' daily shooting schedules were totally different. After production started, though, the studio informed him that it wanted to keep the sets for Dolly a secret and so refused him permission. To work around this, Hill had Robert Redford, Paul Newman, and Catherine Ross simply pose on the sets and took photos of them. He then inserted images of the three stars into a series of 300 actual period photos and spliced the two different sets, real and posed, together to form the New York City montage. So, there's some chance that that wasn't originally going to be a montage at all. They were just going to film regular scenes on these specific sets. And, yeah, that is, like... I, I don't know why the, the... Why the studio couldn't have given him a heads up on that. Hello, Dolly! Wasn't that a huge bomb, anyway? Or am I thinking of... I, I feel like I heard that was... Uh, let's see... Or, or wait, that might have been one of the ones that did well. I just... I remember Lindsay Ellis mentioning it when she talked about how the big musical eventually failed. That might have been one of the ones that did well. Anyway, regardless, I feel like the studio could have told him... Or, I don't know, maybe it's on him for not asking. Anyway... So there's this really great uh, quote where Butch says to Sundance, if he'd just pay me what he's spending to make me stop robbing him, I'd stop robbing him. And then he yells, you probably inherited every penny you got, which I do think is a, a good, if, yeah, you know, obviously the first part is basically a joke. You know, you don't pay people to... You're not supposed to pay people so that they stop robbing you. you know, I, I don't know. Maybe he thinks that he's dealing with American police or something. Anyway, but but yeah, you know, the money is from inheritance. So, yeah. Let's see. And... Right, so so one critic said the gang members are not good people, they're only likable because of their charm, not because of their actions. They're not heroes like the leads in so many westerns, they're not Robin Hood. They are only stealing so they can keep paying for their expensive habits. And I think, I forget if that was, that might have been from a negative review. I do, that that is definitely true. And, I mean, maybe that is supposed to be part of it, you know, if they would accept the the uh, uh, less like you know if they accepted a real job you know yeah they wouldn't be able to keep you know paying for expensive habits but the yeah you know by the time they finally try going straight you know it's basically they've they've ruined it for themselves uh, you know they they're in they're in Bolivia they're trying to go straight working with this guy and it's just, you know, the, the you know, yeah, it, it, it leads to them shooting the, the 
the other robbers, you know. But uh, yeah, if they had tried, you know, way back, yeah. So it, it caught up with them. Is is how I see it. I I don't think we're supposed to think of them as as good people. They're they're charming, and if not, if they weren't charming, the movie would not have been very much fun to watch at all. The fact that the movie will end with the violent death of the two leads is something that is pointed out every so often by characters in the movie. The people who hate them and the people who love them. By people who hate them and people who love them, there's a real sense that for them there is no riding off into the sunset. The first time Robert Redford character kills someone, it's a point of no return. They leave America to go to another country, they still end up being hunted. Their attempt to go straight fails spectacularly. They can't stop robbing. Eventually, even at a place leaves them, despite all that she suffered the, through without leaving their side. Goldman's script emphasizes the sympathetic nature of these outlaws by having them talk their way out of trouble as much as possible, such as in the card game that introduces Sundance. Very true. And, yeah, so, this is the end of the video. Let me know what is your, yeah, just what's your favorite Western overall, or if you want to go by, like, subgenres of Westerns, you know, yeah, put them down in the comments. Is there anything you think should have been changed about this movie? Uh, do you think that it's great that it has a sequel? Do you wish there were more than one? If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. One, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about my thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus Star Wars live action show, which these days is Andor. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time, even if you go to Bolivia. <laughs>